Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for coming. It's a pleasure to be your keynote speaker tonight. Um, thank you to all the conference staff who've put all this together. The NDC conferences are always a great time for the speakers. Uh, so I'm Kyle, and I'm here to talk about the Boeing 737 MAX, a plane that you've probably heard about in the media. Uh, it was a hot topic back in 2019, just before COVID stole the spotlight. Uh, I, I, nobody actually told me I was going to be the party speaker tonight. Um, <laughs> I mean, I should have seen it coming because in, in Oslo last year when I was there, uh, Henriette told me that I had been declared an edutainment speaker, um, which is a bit of a blow to my academic self-esteem, but <laughs> I'll take what I can get. Uh, so with that in mind, I'm going to try to switch it up a little bit and keep it a bit lighter than I usually do. I mean, obviously, it's a very serious topic, and so uh, the party speech was an interesting choice, but um, <laughs> I'm happy to make it work. So I've been trying to think of some other titles that, that might be more fun. Um, you know, when humans and technology don't mix, it, it gets the point across, but maybe how to irreparably damage your company in three easy steps, <laughs> how to get a $62 million CEO retirement package, it takes 102 years to build a reputation and two crashes to destroy it. So when I do this, I also like to have some audience interaction because it's fun, right? It keeps things interesting gets everyone engaged. And normally we do this with like a, who here has done something, is something, and we're going to show of hands. But that's boring, so we're not going to do that. Instead, in the spirit of where we are, when I ask this question, if you, it applies to you, skull, nice and loud, with energy. Similarly, uh, when I ask, somewhat rhetorically, was this a good idea, or does this sound like a good idea? You can either respond with, absolutely, nice and loud, or, hell no, it is not a good idea. So let's do some trial runs here. Who here is enjoying the conference? Oh. Was it a good idea to come? Uh, who had to fly to get here? <laughs> All right. When I was flying on a Boeing plane uh, across the Atlantic to get here, um, I was watching and taking notes on, on a documentary about Boeing planes crashing. Um, the passengers around me and the flight attendants were getting a little uncomfortable. Was that a good idea? <laughs> a mixed reaction on that, but yeah. So a bit about me. I'm Kyle. Um, I went to MIT to do my PhD there in aerospace engineering, focusing on humans in aerospace, human systems integration. Basically how we design technology, uh, complex technological systems for humans to be able to operate them efficiently and safely uh, without harming the systems or harming the humans. And after I did that, I started my own company, Invictin Labs. Uh, we focus on prototyping of various systems, hardware, software, uh, cloud, IoT, that kind of stuff. And we're based in Ottawa, which is the beautiful national capital of Canada. And I also work with a company called TopTal, uh, which is a global network of freelancers who are pretty skilled at what they do. And um, they basically bring you clients, which is very nice for me. What I'm going to talk about today, I want to note, are things to consider, right? We're talking about pretty high-level concepts, uh, but there's way too much technical detail for me to be giving prescriptive instructions on what you should or should not do. So we're talking about things to think about when you're designing your systems, not directions on how to do it. And we come to this topic called human factors engineering, human systems integration. It's all kind of tied together. Uh, and when I say this word, you know, people say, okay, I know what that is. That's UX and UI, right? I do that. And that's true, it does include those components, but it's much more than just that. You have your biomechanics, how bodies move and operate, sensory input, how you actually collect information from your different senses. Often we usually use visual, we always use visual and sometimes audio, uh, but when we start talking about more complex systems, particularly aircraft, uh, we start getting into haptic feedback as well, which is touch, the sense of touch. And we'll get into that a bit more later. Cognitive processing, how you actually process all this information you're getting and what you do with it. Uh, ergonomics, which is how you design things like cockpits such that pilots can sit in them and actually reach all the different controls under things like high G-forces or other weird conditions. And then mental models, which is something we're going to come back to again later, uh, which is this idea that in your mind you understand what the system is thinking and you're thinking in the same way. So this together encompasses human factors engineering. And I also want to touch on life-critical systems. I think a lot of people come to my talk thinking, hey, aircraft are cool. Uh, I want to learn about them and them crashing. 
And well, let's get a show of hands. Who here is here because aircraft are cool? Okay, thank you. Uh, but it's, it's, it, it does include aircraft, yeah. Um, but it's so much more than that. And the reason that I think this is kind of relevant to this particular conference, where, where there have been a number of talks on embedded and life-critical, mission-critical systems, is that the, so many different topics can be considered life-critical, so many different pieces of software. In an airplane, for example, obviously you have your avionics, your engines, your control systems, um, fuselage, anything that can, that if it breaks, you're going to crash. Those are all life critical, but it's also everything else, right? You think about the coffee pot in the galley. If that software fails and that boils over and overflows and the liquid drops down through the, through the floorboards and shorts out some circuits, that is life critical system now, right? Or it burns one of the flight attendants who might be critical for some operation of the aircraft. Emergency services, anything to do with them, um, their communication systems or vehicles or tools, obviously life critical. Telecommunications is, a, is one that people don't often think about this way because, I mean, hey, okay, telecommunications fail, my cell phone doesn't work, I can't text my grandma my cat pictures, but it's actually much more important because now I can't call emergency services. Right? A lot of peop elderly people in some countries um, need to be able to phone their prescriptions into a pharmacy to have them filled and delivered. Or you can't call your family to come take care of you if you need help. So all of a sudden, telecommunications as a whole becomes life critical. Automotive, especially with the advent of self-driving cars, anything that fails there is going to drive you into a wall at 100 kilometers per hour, definitely life critical. Healthcare, not only things like surgical robots, IV pumps, anything that actually medicates you or does surgery on you, but also all the software that is used by healthcare workers to maintain your medical records, for example. Your medical record disappears or the system shows the wrong information and all of a sudden a physician is prescribing you something you're allergic to. It's life critical. Military. Also, obviously anything they touch um, is life critical by design, um, but things can go wrong with the systems they use and there's a lot of research in there. So with that, who here has ever worked on a life critical system of any type? I'd say that's about a third of the room, right? Which is pretty decent for a system like this. And I also want to say, so this is not theoretical, we're trying to keep this light and fun because it's the party talk, but it's also important to keep in mind that this is something serious that actually happened and a lot of people died from it, and there are a lot of families that are still mourning that, um, so we just need to keep that in mind as we go through this. And <laughs> I used to say when I first started doing this talk a couple years ago um, that I'm not assigning blame, Boeing, please don't sue me, yada, 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 but the investigations are done now and we can definitively say <laughs> <laughs> that they are at fault. Um, the, Boeing was actually criminally charged with uh, trying to defraud the FAA and settled that charge for $2.5 billion. So let's talk about what actually happened. <clears throat> Our first flight was Lion Air Flight 610. This is October of 2018, and it crashed into the Java Sea off the coast of Indonesia uh, at over 560 kilometers per hour. That was the last recorded speed. Uh, it probably was going much faster than that when it actually hit, and that killed all 189 people on board. And then about six months later, we had Ethiopian Airlines Flight 302 uh, crashed into terrain, which is the ground, at 926 kilometers per hour, and that killed 157 people on board. And this had a huge worldwide impact. The 737 MAX was grounded worldwide three days after the second crash. That included 387 aircraft that had already been delivered that affected 59 airlines and canceled 8,600 flights per week for 20 months. That is a lot of flights that were canceled. It resulted in an audit of the FAA regulatory process. Uh, basically, the US government said, FAA clearly screwed up. We need to investigate what happened. And that caused quite a, quite a kerfuffle in the US government. And then one of the more important ones is uncertainty around the world in other regulatory bodies. Up until this point, most governments and their aviation regula uh, regulators said, okay, Boeing aircraft is manufactured in the U.S., the U.S. has a relatively reliable government, so if the FAA says that it's safe, we're just going to trust that it's safe and let it fly through our airspace and land at our airports. Well, clearly that wasn't true, right, because the FAA said this aircraft is fine. And so now all of a sudden all these countries around the world are like, okay, do we actually need to start doing our own evaluations of all these different aircraft? And that is a, a massive undertaking. In terms of what actually resulted from that, $20 billion in fines for Boeing, $60 billion in canceled aircraft orders. Boeing is a massive company, but $80 billion is still a massive hit to their pocket. 
over $7 billion in costs for the airlines and the, uh, because the aircraft couldn't fly, and $100 million in lost income for pilots. Now, that number seems small compared to everything else up there, but the pilots union in the U.S. is quite a powerful body that has a lot of sway with the FAA and the airlines and the uh, air manufacturers. And there is no better way to piss off a group of pilots than to deprive them of $100 million. So that actually played quite a role in these proceedings. Looking at the timeline of how we got here, so the, the 737 is a legendary aircraft, right? It's the longest flying aircraft that Boeing has produced, and it's been around for almost 60 years at this point. But in 2006, they said, okay, this thing's gone through so many revisions, it's old, it's time to design a new replacement, a clean sheet design, which means we start with a blank piece of paper, nothing gets carried over from the old design. But then in 2010, Airbus, which is Boeing's primary competitor, launches the A320neo. They announced that this is going to be flying soon. Now, the A320, it's important to note, is very similar in size and capability and range uh, to the 737. They're direct competitors in the same market space. And NEO here stands for New Engine Option. So basically, Airbus, which has also been flying the A320 for a long time, said, we're just going to take the old engines off, we're going to put some bigger, more efficient engines on it, leave everything else the same, and call it a new plane. And the airlines love this because it's the plane they know and love, except now it's more fuel efficient, uh, which is uh, a big impact for them. And shortly after that, they set a record of selling these planes, 730 at a single air show, which is m way more than any previous number. And the month after that, American Airlines orders 260 of them. And what's really important here is that up until this point, American Airlines had exclusively flown Boeing aircraft, right? American Airlines, American aircraft, it's a match made in heaven. But this new A320neo was so appealing that they decided to scrap that and introduce an entirely new logistics chain from Europe just to be able to fly this aircraft. And this scares the hell out of Boeing because it's a sign of bad things to come if one of their biggest customers is now making this change. But at the same time, American Airlines also orders a bunch more 737s, but asks Boeing to put more efficient engines on them. And so Boeing says, okay, we're going to have to make these re-engine 737s for American Airlines anyways, so let's just scrap the idea of a new plane and we'll put all of our efforts into developing a new version of the 737, which we'll call the MAX. And then 2016, the A320neo has its first revenue flight, meaning the first flight operated by an airline that's carrying passengers. And in 2017, Boeing has their first 737 MAX flight. So through this process, Boeing pretty much accomplished what they were trying to do of keeping up with uh, Airbus and having a new plane to market. Why does any of this matter? Okay, N more efficient engines are larger. This is a picture of the engine on the original 737. Right, 1.25 meters in diameter. Uh, it's called a low bypass engine. And you can see it's quite narrow. And this is fine. This is what the plane was originally designed for. We skip over to the third generation, the next generation, they called it. And here we have a much larger high bypass engine that's 1.83 meters in diameter. And then we have the 737 MAX, which is now 2.26 meters in diameter. And the question is, how do you fit an engine that is almost twice the diameter of the original engine on an aircraft of the same original design where nothing else has changed? And the answer is you can't. You cannot do that in the way that it was intended to. It doesn't fit. Because if you try, it looks like this, and your engine's scraping along the ground when you are trying to take off. And that is not good for the engine. So what Boeing does is they shift the engine forward and up, like so. And so this engine is now basically on the front, hanging off the front of the wing, but they've raised it up enough that they have the ground clearance they need. And we can see in a side-by-side -side comparison of the different models, uh, looking from top to bottom, the original on top has a lot of ground clearance, small engine, uh, which is almost directly underneath the wing. And then the bottom, the 737 MAX, has a much larger engine that is just hanging off the front of that wing. The more important piece here is how far forward that engine is sitting. Because what happens is that the nacelle, the casing around the engine, uh, actually generates is such a large surface area that it generates lift when the plane is at a high angle of attack. Meaning that when the plane is pitched up, the airflow moving past that engine generates lift and pushes the plane up. But because the engine is not under the wing where the center of lift should be, it's forward, that lift actually pushes the nose of the plane up and causes it to want to pitch up even further. 
So you have this self-reinforcing loop where the pilot pitches up a little too high, this effect happens, pitches up more, this effect happens more, and you get into a very bad situation very quickly. And the FAA says, no, this is not okay. You can't do this. You can't have a plane that pitches up on its own with no pilot input and is unrecoverable if you don't deal with it. And Boeing's own test pilots say something similar. They say, we've been flying this. It doesn't feel the same as the old 737. doesn't feel good. It has these weird handling characteristics. We need you to fix it. And Boeing tries a couple things. They do some hardware changes, some aerodynamic changes to try to, to deal with this issue, but they can't really without causing major redesigns to the aircraft. And so they decide to solve it in software. And we come to MCAS, the Maneuvering Characteristics Augmentation System. MCAS is an algorithm that sits on the flight control computer. So in our, in our 737, on each side of the cockpit, uh, on the external side, we have this sensor here. And this is called an angle of attack sensor. And what it does is it measures the angle of the airflow moving past it relative to the angle of the plane. The angle that the plane is attacking the air is literally what that term means. And when that plane starts to get into that pitching up situation, that angle of attack sensor starts getting a very high reading. And it starts sending that data into the flight control computer, which is where MCAS is sitting. And MCAS says, uh-oh, we're starting to pitch up too high. This is what we were designed for. We need to fix this situation. So it sends a signal to the uh, what's called the jack screw at the back, which controls the stabilizers. The stabilizers are those little horizontal small wings at the back, uh, which affect the trim. And so it sends a signal to the screw, which basically rotates these things back, which at the back of the aircraft generates lift, which brings the nose of the aircraft down. And so this causes the plane to pitch down, like so. And it stabilizes and now it's no longer generating that extraneous lift from the engine nacelle, and we're back in a stable situation. That's the theory behind MCAS. And if we put this on a nice little systems diagram, now I should note, I am an infrastructure and backend developer. I don't do front end work. I don't do graphics work. So this is not looking great, but it uh, gets the point across. So we have the sensors, the angle of attack sensors, which are on the side, which are connected to the flight control computers. There are two flight control computers, one on each side of the plane. And each sensor is attached to its own flight control computer. They're not cross-linked. And what happens is MCAS is sitting on those flight control computers, and it sends a signal to the um, stabilizers at the back, which rotates them. We'll take a little break on that to talk about something called type ratings. So a type is a category of aircraft that all have similar characteristics, similar handling characteristics, similar performance characteristics. And a type rating is a certification that allows a pilot to fly aircraft that are in a type. And type ratings are a pain to get. They're very expensive and they're very time consuming and airlines avoid them at all costs because pilots have to go through a ground school. They have to go through a lot of time in a simulator. The simulators are many millions of dollars each. They have to do an oral exam and they have to do a check ride with an instructor pilot to make sure they've actually learned and memorized all these skills. And this whole thing um, takes a very long time and is very expensive, not only because of all the equipment, uh, but because every hour that a pilot is doing this is an hour that they're not flying for the airline and therefore not generating revenue. So airlines try to avoid this. Uh, and so we have a type here. The A330 is a, is a type and we see there are different variants within that type. And the important part is that the A320 is also a type. And if we compare two variants within the A320 type, we see why they are the same. These are two different models of aircraft that look almost identical in the cockpits. The controls are the same, the layout's the same, displays are the same, everything's almost identical. So a pilot doesn't even really need to know which variant they're flying. Within a type rating, the different variants to move from one to the other, to, to be approved to fly a new one, basically a pilot just has to do a, a brief course on a tablet to go over some very basic differences in performance and weight and such, and that's about it. No simulator, no check ride, no exam, no ground school. And the reason the A320neo was so successful is because they managed to pull this off where they got it into the same type rating as all the previous A320s. So all these airlines that were already flying this, the older models could buy the new model and all their pilots could just fly it without having to go through all this extra training and simulator time. Now the 737 is also a type and all the previous variants had fallen within the same type as desired. And so the question is, could Boeing get the MAX into the same type category? 
because that's the only way they could be competitive. Otherwise, no one's going to buy it if all of their pilots have to go through all this extensive training. But the problem is that MCAS is a new control system, and a new control system means a pilot needs a different training. And different training means it gets a different type rating, and a different type rating means it's no longer competitive, and this makes Boeing very upset because they know that no one's going to buy their aircraft, and um, it's just simply not going to sell. But they come up with a solution, and their solution is you don't tell anyone about MCAS. <laughs> because if you don't know about MCAS, you don't need training on MCAS, right? And if there's no MCAS training, then you get the same training as the older 737. And if it's the same training, it's the same type rating, it's the same type rating, now it's a competitive aircraft, and this makes Boeing thrilled. And they're very proud of themselves, patting themselves on the back. What a great solution. Does this seem like a good idea? <laughs> but that's what they did. Uh, so Boeing decided the 737 pilots didn't need any extra training, didn't even need to know about it, wasn't in the flight manuals. Well, not quite. They, it was originally in the flight manuals, and then they were worried about it causing this extra training, so they took it out, but they left the acronym in the glossary. So the acronym is still in the back of the flight manual, but nowhere in the manual is it actually mentioned or used. So that allowed them to get the common type rating with the previous models, so all the pilots could fly the MAX, yada, yada, exactly what they were trying to do, successful. Now, their justification for doing this uh, as told by Dennis Muhlenberg, who was the CEO of Boeing. He said that the system, MCAS is fundamentally embedded in the system and the handling qualities of the aircraft. It's not a separate system to be trained on. Basically, he's saying that because a pilot doesn't actually interact with it, they don't turn it on, turn it off, they can't turn it on or off, um, they don't need to know about it because they never actually interact with it. little spoiler alert here, Mr. Muhlenberg is no longer the CEO of Boeing. <laughs> But it worked, their plan worked. Um, training on moving to the new aircraft took a pilot who was already type certified uh, one hour on an iPad to fly the new airplane and that is it, they're off carrying passengers. What's interesting is that some of the airlines they were selling this thing to actually wanted that extra training though. They wanted the simulators, they wanted simulator time for their pilots. But Boeing did not take kindly to that because they were worried that if some airlines start doing this, then some of the aviation authorities are going to say, okay, no, maybe that should be a requirement, and then you have a big problem. A text sent from one Boeing employee to another, now friggin' Lion Air might need a sim to fly the MAX, and maybe because of their own stupidity, I'm scrambling trying to figure out how to unscrew this now. Idiots. Is this a good way to talk to your customers? So you can see they were quite worried about this. And does anyone notice the name of the airline in here? Yeah, that was the first one that crashed. So let's talk about their manual overrides for MCAS. This is a cockpit of a 737. A couple things to note here. On the side of the yoke, you have these little toggle switches called trim switches. What they do is they control the electric motor, the same one that MCAS uses, which rotates the stabilizer to trim the aircraft. And then at the bottom, you have your trim cutout switches. These are just electric switches that completely disconnect the flight control computer from the uh, trim motor, so that electric motor does not function anymore when you turn those off. And then you have this manual trim wheel, which is a little wheel which is next to the pilot's knee. And it has a little handle that flips out. And this is mechanically linked to the stabilizer. Right, so there's actually a cable that runs back. Um, and so when the stabilizer moves, this moves. And when this moves, the stabilizer moves. And if we add those to our diagram, our trim switch is somewhere up here. It sends that signal to the computers, which then sends it off to the stabilizer motor. And our cutout switch is here. It disconnects the entire system. And our trim wheel is here. It is mechanically linked. It cannot be disconnected. So details of the flights. This is a graph showing the altitude and speed of that flight. And this is not a normal flight path. As you can see, about two minutes in, uh, there's this first weird situation happens where the, where the plane drops in altitude suddenly, picks up a lot of speed, but then they recover and keep climbing. And then more like four, five minutes in, we start this weird oscillation pattern where they're going down and up and down and up and down and up until eventually that overpowers them and they drop down into the ocean. Here's a little video clip showing what... Um, it looks like in the ocean after a plane crashes there. The components that are left are very small and difficult to find. A lot of them are underwater, bottom of the ocean. 
uh, and it makes the investigation extremely difficult and long. Some, oftentimes, they can't even find the flight recorder or cockpit voice recorder uh, because they've been damaged so bad or they're so far underwater that they can't be found. And that makes the investigation very difficult. These were long investigations that have finally come to a close, um, but it's quite a process. So what happened here is that the angle of attack sensor that was connected to the active flight control computer uh, failed somehow. It started sending erroneous data into the control computer. And it could have been a number of things. It could have been a sensor that was faulty when it was installed. It could have been a bird strike that broke it during flight. It could have been a number of different things, but it failed. And what happens then is it sends that signal into MCAS, and MCAS is getting this, this erroneous data that's saying the plane is pitched up far too high. So MCAS activates, and that triggers that stabilizer to rotate uh, into the trim down position. And it does this for 10 seconds at a time with a five second interval in between. So 10 seconds on, five seconds off. And so it's, that's why you're starting to see this oscillation pattern because it's trimming down, it stops, the pilots are pulling back on the stick as hard as they can, so, they're trying, so it pulls up a bit and then it happens again. So the pilots don't understand what's happening. So they try to use um, their electric trim to counteract it. It only works during the five second period where MCAS isn't firing. Uh, and they go back and forth and lose this battle, and eventually MCAS overpowers them, and, and down they go. And so now we can see why that oscillation pattern, pattern at the top there is happening. So after this happens, and they recover the data recorder and actually get some, some sensor measurements off of it, I believe it updates at 8, to eight hertz. Um, so it's a pretty up-to-date um, recording of the sensor measurements. And Boeing and the FAA get together and they start reviewing this data and they say, what could have happened here? And they think they know what might have, what might have occurred because that angle of attack sensor has very, very bizarre data. And so they put together what's called an airworthiness directive, which is basically a bulletin that gets sent out to all the pilots who are certified to fly this aircraft. And uh, it tells you what to do in the event that something like this happens. You're supposed to turn off the autopilot and try to pull back on the stick to pull up and then use your, mat, your electric trim switch. If that doesn't work, uh, turn the, those cutoff switches to off to disable the electric control altogether. And if it's still having a problem, then use that manual wheel that we talked about to crank the stabilizer into a trim up position. So all the pilots that fly this aircraft have to read this and understand it before they're allowed to keep flying. So then we come to our second flight. This is a chart again, showing the altitude of the aircraft over time. And we're starting to see some real similarities here, right? We're seeing about two minutes in a sudden drop and recovery and drops and recovery in this oscillation pattern again until eventually uh, down it goes. And this is what it looks like when an aircraft hits the ground at 930 some kilometers per hour. Uh, it's again, very difficult to recover anything. It's easier than in the water because at least the parts are still there and accessible but um, it's still a massive undertaking to try to investigate the, the crash. Fortunately, they found the data recorder quite quickly and were able to um, access the center data off of it. So again, what happened? Well, same issue. Angle of attack sensor, busted. Don't know why, but something happened to it. MCAS activates, same thing. But this time, those pilots, they've read that directive and they recognize this, right? So they know this is what they're supposed to do. So they disabled those cutout switches, right, following the instructions. And then they try to use their manual wheel to rotate the stabilizer back into position, again, following the directive. They did what they were supposed to do. The problem is that during takeoff is one of the only times that a plane is at full throttle in a regular flight. And so these pilots had taken off at the full throttle, and then very shortly after takeoff, these issues started coming up that completely distracted them from the normal flight operations. And so this plane, while they were battling with this for quite a few minutes, the plane was still at full throttle and eventually got to a speed that was far higher than it should have been at that point in its flight. And because it was moving so quickly and this stabilizer was rotated back so far, the flow of air against the stabilizer caused so much force that the pilots did not have the strength to rotate that manual wheel to trim it back because they were battling this massive amount of air pressure against it. So they recognize this, they cannot turn the wheel and they think that, well, they can't fix it doing it manually. So the only chance they have is to reactivate that um, electric system to use the electric assist. But of course, as soon as they do that, MCAS, which has still been running in the background the whole time, it's just been disconnected from what it's supposed to actuate. 
um, gets connected again, and the situation gets worse, and it drives them nose down into the ground. So to recap, they modified the existing design, which changed the aerodynamics of the aircraft, and they couldn't fix it. Is that a good idea? They couldn't solve it without a redesign, so they solved a hardware and aerodynamics problem in software. Is that a good idea? <laughs> and they didn't tell the pilots so they wouldn't have to train on it. How about that one? Good idea? But the pilots didn't know what's happening, right? So that's how you get accident number one, which is your Lion Air flight. They get the airworthiness directive. Now, they, they gave you instructions on what to do, right? But Boeing never actually said what the problem is. They still haven't told anyone about MCAS at this point. And the pilots are not physically able to follow those instructions, so you get accident number two, Ethiopian Airlines. And that kind of concludes the summary of, of what happened here. And so let's talk about what we actually learned from this and what we need to think about. The first question is, when do you actually teach users about the inner workings of a complex system? Not just aerospace or an aircraft, but any kind of very complicated technical system that takes a long time to learn all the details. So I want to illustrate this with an example. Let's say we have a new car. And you can tell this presentation was made a couple years ago when that looked like a new car. Um, and this car, straight out of the factory, has a defect. Just one defect. It's very rare. It doesn't happen often, unlikely. But sometimes it just accelerates on its own. And you can't stop it. But it's rare. Don't worry about it. Now, to deal with this, we have two options. Option number one is what is printed in the technical manual, very deep down in the details. And this is the proper way to fix the problem, and it's guaranteed to work. So you have to hold the accelerator pedal at its maximum position for four seconds while simultaneously pumping the brake three times at one second intervals. And then you have to apply the emergency brake at 33% for eight seconds. But after releasing the accelerator, but before you release the emergency brake, you have to activate the four-way hazard flashers and apply the horn for 3.6 seconds. <laughs> and if you do this properly, if you follow these directions, well, here's the kicker, you have to start doing it within 10 seconds of noticing there's a problem or it's not going to work. 10 seconds was the time that the FAA later determined that if the pilots did not respond to the situation within 10 seconds by following the perfect directions, there was no chance of recovery. 10 second window. If you do it within the time window, you're guaranteed to resolve your issues. It's perfect. Now, this seems ridiculous, right? But if you've ever seen some of the checklists that pilots have to go through uh, for certain flight operations, they get incredibly complex. Then you have option number two, which is you turn off the engine and you attempt to maintain control of your vehicle while you apply the brakes. And you have an 85% chance, chance of succeeding with this, right? You might get into a sticky situation and crash, but you'll probably be okay. Now, let's say we have two users. We have your average Joe. He's been driving for 15 years, and you know he kind of knows what he's doing. And you have Speedy Sally, who's an F1 race car driver. Uh, she spends her entire career every day, eight hours a day, training on her vehicle. Given these two options, which options do you tell or provide to each of these operators? And you generally do something like this. Joe has no idea what he's doing. There's not a chance that he's ever going to remember a checklist like that. And so if the situation happens, especially under stress, and he's not very well trained to deal with stress, he's not going to follow the rules, and he's going to screw it up, and he's going to crash. So even though it has a guaranteed 100% chance of success if you do it right, he's not going to do it right, so it doesn't really matter. So instead, we give him the option that's the intuitive option, the common sense approach, what is not as perfect, but it's more likely for him to actually be able to do it because he is not a professional user. But Sally, on the other hand, you know, like I said, she does this all day, every day. She can actually memorize a checklist like this, and she can practice it and rehearse it on the track and get it down to the point where if it happens within two seconds, she'll be able to respond properly. And these form two points, two endpoints, I want to call performance versus knowledge curve or complexity versus knowledge curve because often performance and complexity go hand in hand. And sticking with our mode of transportation, we can plot some points on here. If we look at walking, for example, it's a very low performance uh, method of, of movement but a pretty low level of knowledge required to do it. And then you have cycling. You're moving faster, but you actually have to learn how to do it and train on it. Driving a car, you keep moving up this scale, and you have your race car at the top. And the idea being that as your performance of your system and complexity of your system increases, you need to know more about how it works in order to be able to safely and effectively actually operate it. And we see that with our aircraft as well. 
At the bottom end, you're starting on your Cessna, where most people pick it up as their first plane. Start moving into commercial airliners, much more complex, but much more um, performance. And then you have your fighter jets near the top, where it is a career where you're spending more time training than you are actually flying in order to be able to operate it safely. And this applies not just to transportation, but to all sorts of different things. Um, we look at computers, right? My grandmother has her little stock laptop CPU, uh, easy to use. She need, needs to turn it on or off and back on again, and it works fine. Versus my computer, I've overclocked it. And to do this, you get more performance, but you need to know about voltage regulation, thermal management, water cooling, however else you want to do it. Uh, so you get the performance, but you need a lot more knowledge. You can see it with your little kid skis for the bunny hill versus skis that actually have bindings, right? You need to know how to use them, how to tension them, how to fit them properly. And you see this with your Mac computers and your Linux computers. Higher performance, <laughs> higher level of knowledge required. And this gets me very different reactions depending on the conference I'm at. <laughs> I think this was the right one for this. Yeah. All right. Was that a good idea? But if we put these on our graph, we see that it follows the same trend, right? This, this holds true for most systems and most domains and most industries. So the question here is, should Boeing have told the pilots about MCAS? I think most of us would now say, yeah, yeah, probably. Like Pilots are really expected to know and understand most of the systems in their aircraft that they're flying. Not the deep technical details of how they actually work at a software level, but at least their presence and their impact on flight parameters. But... Boeing concluded that there would be little risk in the event of an MCAS failure because the pilots, and the FAA approved this, the pilots would respond to a failure in, within three seconds. So it's okay if it breaks because the pilots will fix it within three seconds. However, Boeing and the FAA agreed they wouldn't tell the pilots about it uh, because Boeing's safety analysis expected the pilots to be, uh, sorry, they wouldn't tell them about it even though they were the primary backstop. And I want to pause to note that, um, as you may know, Boeing was historically headquartered in uh, Seattle, Washington. They moved their headquarters to Chicago in the mid to late 90s in a situation that was actually quite closely associated with what happened to Boeing over the following two decades. Um, but they actually, because they were in the same city, they have a long and storied history of covering Boeing uh, in the news, and they actually won a Pulitzer Prize for, for their coverage of the previous generation of the 737. So that's why we're looking at their quotes as a reputable source. So they didn't tell the pilots about it. Uh, they decided not to follow that curve, and we got these accidents. The next question is, how do you ensure that your users actually know what is happening in a complex system? And this comes back to some of those things I mentioned about uh, human factors, particularly mental models. We have this thing called mode confusion, uh, particularly in aircraft, because it was a field of research that really stemmed around aircraft and spacecraft. Because in these types of vehicles, you have many different modes the vehicle, vehicle can be operating in. You have an autopilot mode, and you have an auto throttle mode, which are not necessarily the same thing. You have a takeoff configuration and a landing configuration. And in all these different configurations, the same buttons and switches and displays can do or show you different things. So you could press a button expecting it to do one thing, but if it's in a different mode than what you think it is, it could do something entirely different. And this gets very confusing for pilots, especially when things change without them being aware of it, particularly due to automation in the background. And this issue comes up even before you have things like MCAS dancing around back there, messing with your control inputs and your flight parameters without you being aware of it. And this causes great confusion for your pilots. And it is a theme that you see in almost every accident, major accident investigation report, is that the pilots got confused about what was happening in the aircraft before they crashed. Very rarely is a crash due to pure mechanical failure. Usually it is due to something breaks, which causes confusion for the pilots, which they could have recovered from if they had really understood what was happening, but they didn't due to a situation like this. And now I'm going to show you a video. This is a simulator from uh, an Air France flight that crashed in 2009. Unrelated, it was on an Airbus um, over, the, uh, over the Atlantic Ocean. I think it was going from uh, Brazil to, to Paris. And this shows you what the cockpit sounds like during one of these emergencies. Uh, that's the alarm. Stall alarm. Over the next four and a half minutes, the stall warning will sound 75 times. So that's from a documentary about the crash, but it kind of shows you that 
even in this situation, they, their, their aircraft was stalling, um, and you can hear that stall alarm going off 75 times. You think they might notice after the first time, and maybe they understand the situation, but instead we're just hammering them with that continuously, even though they already know. And the problem is that that then interferes with other information that you're trying to tell them, such as why you're stalling. Here's another one. This is in a 747. So not only is it loud, like those pilots can barely talk to each other, but it's also very stressful, right? You're inducing a huge amount of adrenaline, which is not conducive to trying to perform calm and rational actions that you need to do to recover from this situation. And we know that this played a role in the 737 crashes. Uh, there were at least five different alarms going off in those crashes. And in, in this video, you hear two. So, you know, times that by two and a half, and you get an idea of what those pilots were dealing with. And they struggled to understand it. They couldn't figure out what was going on, and those warnings weren't really helping them understand why the plane was actually pitching down and why they couldn't fix it. But this isn't a surprise to anyone. Right? This is a known issue. Right? This is what I did a lot of my PhD research in. This is what people have been doing, researching for 50 years, particularly at NASA for spacecraft. And we know that this is a problem. Based on lessons learned from past airline accidents, the FAA regulations have precise design details on how to deal with these things. And they are aimed at ensuring three things, that the pilot knows what is going on, that it catches their attention, and that it averts any possible confusion. Now, the second one there is very easy to do. As I showed you in that video, it's easy to catch someone's attention. You just make a loud noise or shake their, their control stick. But doing that in combination with one and three is much more difficult, right? How do you get their attention in a way that does not distract them from actually understanding what you're trying to convey to them? And these regulations, they didn't just come out of nowhere. These are written in blood, right? Like these are from past accidents. And that is why we have these rules. In 2014, Boeing convinced the FAA to relax the standards for the 737 MAX related to the cockpit alerts that would warn the pilots if something went wrong. Their justification for this was because the aircraft, the airframe is so old and we're only trying to change this one part of the design, it would be cost prohibitive for us to try to upgrade this entire thing to meet the standards. The FAA said, okay. And that was it. That was the end of it. They were completely okay with it. And that is one of the reasons that they're at the front at the beginning. I said Boeing and the FAA both played equal roles in, this, in these tragedies. This is not a solution. Like I'm saying, I'm not telling you what you should or should not do when you design your systems, because obviously this is a very difficult and complex problem that is not solved in any way. But there are plenty of good guidelines and standards and, and recommendations for how to design warning systems in a way that doesn't overload your pilots. So that is just something you need to consider when you're working on a system like this. Let's talk about manual override, particularly for MCAS. Did MCAS have a manual override? Was it used appropriately? Let's talk about levels of automation. Now, this is a concept that um, has had a, a very extensive amount of research on it. Uh, there are different scales ranging from 3 to 12 plus different levels of automation, depending on which scientist you ask. But I've kind of condensed it down into four primary levels here. Your first one being a system that provides helpful information. So you tell it what you want, or it guesses what you want, and it provides you information that could help you do it, right? So your, your Google Maps is a good example. It's not driving your car for you. It's not making you turn left and right on the sidewalk. It's just telling you what you should do to meet your objective. Your second level is automatic control when directed by a human, the cruise control in your car. It doesn't turn itself on. When you turn it on, it automates things until you turn it off or it meets some end condition, such as touching the brakes. Your third level is automatic control unless directed by a human. Windows Update is a great example. It will do its thing, and it will restart your computer at the worst possible time unless you manually intervene to stop it from doing so. And then your fourth level is automatic control with no human override. And this is a much harder to come up with an example for because there are relatively few systems in the world that don't have some big red emergency stop button that'll shut down the automation. But where we start to see this is particularly in spaceflight, uh, if you remember the New Horizons probe that went past Pluto and it took all those really cool photos, uh, that entire procedure where it did a, a lot of different um, movements to aim the camera at different things, that was all choreographed in advance. And once it started, there was no way for a human to, to stop it because of latency. And even if they did want to stop it, there's no way a person can think fast enough to tell it what it should do instead. Where does MCAS fit on this? 
we could say that it's three, level three, because it automatically does its thing unless the human turns off that cutoff switch. But is that, is that cutoff switch really disabling the automation? It's not. All it's doing is it's unhooking the automation from the thing it's supposed to be controlling, but the automation is still running there in the background. And by unhooking that or using that breaker that breaks the connection, they were also disabling other critical functionality, which is their, their electric toggle switch that controls the trim. So is it really a manual override if you can't use it without disabling a bunch of other critical systems and such that when you reconnect it, it's still failing right from the start? Redundancy. Not so much to do with humans and technology, but we've spent all this time talking about the planes. We need to mention it. And it's certainly relevant for what we do in this conference. Who here can see the redundancy failure in the systems diagram? Oh, man. Okay, a couple of hands. All right. So in case you, here, can you see this? There we go. Right here. This sensor is con connected to one computer. One computer is active at a time. This sensor isn't doing squat over there. It's not, a, its data isn't even being used. So when that first sensor fails, your system is broke, right? The flight control computers, the pilots can manually switch from one to the other in the case of a computer failure. But when the sensor breaks, the computer doesn't know that the sensor broke, and so it can't tell the pilots that the sensor broke, and the pilots don't know that they should switch to the other computer. So we have a single point of failure here in that angle of attack sensor. And we can see that more obviously in this graph. These are our two sensors. This is data they pulled off the flight data recorder. And we can see that the left sensor is the red line, and the right sensor is the black. Well, we can guess which sensor was connected to the active flight computer at the time. So where the, where the reading spikes up is where we think that a bird hit it and broke it off. But what do you actually do about this? Well, first off, do not ever let a syst critical system have a single point of failure, right? We're working on a lot, of, a lot of critical embedded systems with people in this room. I'm sure most of you are already aware of this. But the less common one is don't let a broken sensor affect good sensors. Here we had a good sensor that was still getting good data. We could have used it, but we didn't. But what happens when you do that? How do you deal with those two sensors disagreeing with each other? Well, ideally, you'd add a third sensor and you'd have some sort of consensus mechanism, right? Like a lot of distributed systems use a, an approach like this. But you can't always do that. There could be technical limitations. Um, there could be there could be cost prohibitive. It's always a trade-off between cost and 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 performance. So maybe we do something like forcing a manual override. We can read the two sensors and we can alert the pilots that hey, these things aren't agreeing. Something is out of whack. One of these is broken. We don't know which one, so we can't automate anything. So that you, the pilot, you need to take over. That could work, and it would probably would have worked in this situation. But the problem here is that imagine you're flying your plane along on autopilot and all of a sudden the automation kicks off. You have no idea why and your plane just starts drifting off to the side and you need to take control. And you start getting into this mode confusion situation again because now you are not aware of what mode your airplane is, is in, why the autopilot failed, and why you are now required to take control of it. So it's hard, right? This is not, again, not a solution. It's just talking about a lot of these problems you really need to think about because they're all interconnected. It's this tangled web of problems where to solve one, you make the other worse. Change management. Again, not so human related unless you're considering the engineers to be the, the humans in your system. In this, so MCAS was originally designed to only operate under very specific conditions. Basically, if, you're, if your aircraft was flying at a fair, at cruising speed and somehow pitched up too high, and started to get into that reinforcement loop with the lift in the front, then the system would kick in. And it did this by requiring two different sensors. You had the angle of attack sensor that I talked about and a G-force sensor. Because if you're flying at a high speed and you pitch up all of a sudden, that's quite a G-force uh, change and your sensor will trigger. But what happened is the pilots when they were the test pilots, when they were doing takeoffs in this aircraft, they thought, or they said to, to Boeing, this does this feels weird, right? Um, and when MCAS activates, we like that. It helps with the with the flight control. So give us more MCAS, right? Make it happen more often. Uh, it helps us with with controlling the takeoffs. So Boeing said, okay, we're going to have MCAS applied during the takeoff phase as well. But the problem is that during takeoff, the plane is moving at low speed, which means there are no real G forces to deal with. 
So they had to disable the G-force sensor so that MCAS could work during a takeoff phase. So now you have a system like this that is only activated by a single sensor. The other issue is that when you're moving at low speed during the takeoff phase, when you're moving at low speed, an, a control surface on an aircraft has to move more to have the same effect because there's less air moving over it. So they had to increase the power of MCAS as well. So when the planes finally entered service, MCAS was able to move the tail four times further than was stated in the initial safety analysis document. So they did their safety analysis on this system, and then they removed one of the triggers, and then they quadrupled the power, and at no point did they redo the safety analysis. How did that get through a change management system? Retiring a system. Now, I think given the nature of this conference in C++ and C, a lot of people in here are probably <laughs> pretty familiar with legacy, legacy systems, right? I bet a lot of people in here have been working on Fortran or COBOL-based systems in the not too recent past, not too distant past. I, I think at some point, an engineer needs to recognize when something has reached its limits, when it is unsafe to push it further, when, to, when trying to add new features is just going to break everything and possibly kill people. Boeing had this thought, right? In 2006, they said, we've pushed this plane to, to its limits. We need a new design. But because of market pressures, because of poor management, because of a culture where people couldn't speak up, it made it through as an additional model that was past its design limits. It was not built to handle engines of that size. So we come to kind of our responsibilities as developers and engineers. What do we do about this? Unless you're some high-level executive in a company like Boeing, you're not going to have a whole lot of sway. But when someone asks you to develop something and you think, should I really quadruple the power of this system or remove this safety check without doing anything about it to evaluate whether it's safe, you probably need to raise your voice about that. At Boeing, they couldn't. The engineers, actually, a number of engineers tried to do that and resigned from Boeing when they couldn't. Boeing, at the time, their management penalized engineers from writing safety concerns in, in emails in case it could show up in court later. They would dock your bonus pay if you wrote up a safety concern in writing. That is not a healthy culture to work in. And I strongly encourage you, if you're working on a system like this and you're facing that kind of issue, find a new employer. It's a hot market out there. You'll have no problem with it. Because what I guarantee you don't want is to feel the way a lot of engineers at Boeing do right now, or previous engineers at Boeing, with the weight of those deaths on your shoulders for the rest of your career. And I'm not saying you need to do all these things for your next WordPress install. Um, but if you're working on anything where a life could be involved, uh, absolutely, there's thing, these are things that need to be considered. So with that, thank you for your time. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you about it. Hopefully it was fun enough for the party atmosphere. Um, this is my email here. Email me with anything you want. I'm happy to talk about it. I'll be here the rest of the evening, so come up and talk to me as well if you'd like to chat. Um, there's a QR code for TopTel if you're interested. You can get a pretty hefty bonus if you have certain skills. Um, thank you for your time. Since, yeah, since there's no one really after me other than a C++ quiz in half an hour, um, I'm happy to take any questions that anyone has or would like to chat about. that could have been implemented? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, there were... Pardon? Uh, the question was, so we discovered this secret unsafe system that had been built into the aircraft. Have there been any other situations where we have discovered, due to an accident or some other cause, a different secret system that shouldn't have been there? Um, in terms of secrets... Yes, there are, and I know that I've studied them. I can't remember specific names. Um, but in this aircraft in particular, during so at, when it was grounded, obviously Boeing and the FAA, who were humiliated by this, spent all of their resources thoroughly investigating this plane. And what's actually kind of funny about it is that this plane is probably one of the safest aircraft to fly in now because it is one of the only aircraft in the last... 
few decades that has gone through such intense scrutiny. And so we actually know that it's probably not going to fail. Um, but during that investigation phase, they found a not, quite a few other issues. They found uh, metal fragments in the uh, fuel tanks um, and some other, I think there was another algorithm issue they found as well that they had to fix. So yeah, there are plenty of problems that get discovered. In theory, yeah, uh, it's doesn't the FAA require redundancy on all components of a plane? Yeah, so it's three systems for critical systems. If the safety analysis or the engineering defines it as something that if it fails, the plane will crash, then it requires three systems. So that's generally hydraulics and certain other flight control systems. What happened here is that Boeing said, this is not a critical system because if it fails, the pilots can still fly the plane. So it didn't meet that requirement for having to be redundant. It's the same type. Yeah, it's still the same type. Basically, they altered... This part I haven't researched as much, but I believe what happened is they, they altered the MCAS algorithm to not trigger as often, and they added redundancy between these two sensors, and basically they ended up coming back to their original argument of a pilot doesn't interact with the system, so they don't need to train on it. Hell no. Yeah. Yeah. With with what? Ah, so uh here, let me pull up. Actually I don't have an Airbus diagram here. But um if we look at this, so the seven thirty seven, uh the wings are mounted very low on the fuselage. Right? They're quite low to the ground, and it was designed that way for aerodynamic reasons when they were using small engines. The seven oh sorry, the A three twenty is a newer aircraft is still very old, but it was designed with the wings mounted much higher on the fuselage. So they actually had plenty of space under the wings to mount the newer engines and didn't have to do the whole shift forward and up situation. Yeah. There were, against Boeing, yep. Uh, the, they were charged with trying to defraud the FAA. Well, I'm not exactly sure how the corporate government works, governance works. I think when a corporation gets charged, some of the executives take responsibility for that, but um, I don't think any individuals were. And they were charged, but it was settled out of court for $2.5 million. And I believe one of the reasons for settling out of court is that if Boeing was, had a criminal record, they can't provide things for the federal government anymore, and Boeing was one of the only providers of certain types of spacecraft and stuff, so it was a huge deal. Yeah, yeah. Sole sourcing, it's great. Any others? Oh, another one. I'm, I'm not a lawyer. I would agree with you, but I have no jurisdiction there. What's interesting that you mentioned the culture, and this is something I don't really have time to talk about in the talk, but it's kind of fun to talk about after. Feel free to go get beer or food or whatever you want, by the way. Um, is that so Boeing historically has been the opposite, right? They have been very engineer driven uh, and had a very strong culture of, of engineers bringing concerns forward and having more of a collegiate relationship instead of a top down relationship. Uh, in 1997, I believe, they merged with McDuck's, yeah. Uh, and McDoug McDonald, something Douglas, yeah. And um, that company had the opposite culture. And even though Boeing, I believe, acquired Douglas, um, the Douglas CEO became the Boeing CEO. And so that whole management style was replicated throughout Boeing. And so you see this trend over the next five, 10 years of all the really good engineers bailing because they, couldn't, they didn't want to be part of this new culture. Uh, and you get things like the 737 MAX, yeah.
illustrate the importance of being honest because, well, you can in short term earn money and be dishonest, but in the long run, uh, it's, it's not just the Boeing, but you also have the diesel gate on Volkswagen. Uh, that means that in the long run, being dishonest with uh, quality can be very uh, expensive and it can even uh, ruin a company. Yeah, but it's a question of how do you define long run? And if you have a CEO and you're already 70 and you're only going to be there for five more years, do you really care about the long run? Or do you care about your retirement package, which is based on stock price? And it's part of, I mean, there's a whole bunch of issues around corporate America that we can go into at a later time. But um, yeah, it does, there's no motivation for long-term uh, success, really. Yeah. All right. I think that's everything. Thank you again. And I'll see you around out there.